Perfect. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Sorry, Brandon. I wasn't sure if you were going to take the lead there or not. So I just jumped in. But oh. um, uh, we are joined today by uh, well, I just want to say very quickly because I have a lot of new um, uh, subscribers publicly and some new members as well. Uh, we are joined today, of course, by Brandon, who many of you know very well from Expanding Reality. But we are also joined by someone who who's also a, an architect by trade, but someone who I believe two to three months ago, we did an episode with uh, called Antiquitech. And I believe We've done uh, two or three episodes. This is either the third or the fourth, I believe. But um, there's been a, a new influx on my end, at least, of people. So if you could, Matt, introduce yourself, please. And then uh, Brandon, of course, and we'll get to what we want to discuss. Uh, Matthew Smith, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you both uh, very much for hosting this. And uh, yeah, hosting this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I'm an architect and a designer builder. Um by trade and just by passion, uh, lifetime of building and designing cool buildings. Um, my architecture work is at dreamdesignbuild.org or at Yurt Designs on Instagram. Uh, I started a podcast to look into old world architecture and, uh, you know, this whole field of um, research that has really grown up in the last uh five six seven eight years uh my podcast is on youtube it's a marvelous old world if people want to check that out i'm up in the seattle area so i've been focusing on uh, seattle in the northwest and uh yeah just super uh, looking forward to this conversation and and seeing seeing what transpires hell yes absolutely and of All course brandon brand. yourself brother yeah, this is awesome. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Brandon Thomas, uh, experienced in reality. And as we were talking about uh, this here, and I'm just going to go ahead and screen share while we're doing this, just to pull up a couple of reference photos while we're talking about what we're talking about here, which would be this idea of Antiquitech, if I can get this out of the way, there we are. Uh, and you know this this really cool idea of that there was a lot of technology back in the day and then i'm looking here at images just when you type this up it pulls up so many things that we've referenced here but really this uh dolce uh, uh dolchow charles a a dolchow were these drawings and there's a book by dennis crenshaw uh read it this year and it details all of this fascinating technology with these silk woven balloons that were powered by some NB gas was what it was called. And then there's a whole story about how only one guy had control of it. So there seems to be some secrets that were unlocked back in the day. And as we're talking here as well, I just want to give a shout out to Unarium Wisdom. This is a very cool site. If you guys want to check this thing out, it's got a bunch of cool graphics that we'll just kind of have up right while we're talking about this stuff. But just these I, the ideas that there was so much more wisdom about the true nature of this reality, or at least how to pull energy from it and mm. to produce something viable for human beings to not only, you know, just like survival was just a non sequitur. It was like, yeah, yeah, we're going to survive. It's a thrive thing. They were in sort of thrival, which is, I feel, what we're going towards with all this, this new research, Dave, with what you're talking about, uh, with all the incredible things just coming out right now and all the illumination occurring. I feel that we're really returning to a time of this wonder. You know, where we don't, we can just stick an antenna outside and be like, oh, yeah, yeah we power everything. And there's no well, need it, to get some grid or something. I couldn't agree more with you. And as a matter of fact, when you guys are, are done your, your parts, I'd love to, I've actually put together in the last two minutes a little bit of a web page presentation as well that I'd love to add to what you just showed, Brandon. So yeah. if uh, e either of you guys wanted to jump in first, I don't want to hog anything. So, because I'll probably need two, three minutes to ramble. Yeah, hop in and let's do that. And then um, let's talk about it because I love this. Yeah, yeah sure. Ramble away, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds good. Okay, so there's a couple things I find very interesting in the sense of uh, we could talk about uh, what we call, you know, suppressed history and things like that. And I want to thank you, Brandon, for sharing what you did there about the Sonoro Aero Club. And the reason I say that is because there's a couple things that uh, that really stand out to me in general, which is the so uh, before I start sharing my screen, let's begin with this idea that what we can call compressed air and or pneumatic valves and things like, for example, a common home heat pump may in fact be able to, uh, what can we say, um, uh, emit and amplify not just clean renewable energy, if you want to call it, but a whole other source of energy that this Sonoro Club seemed to have understood. And the reason I say that is because I don't mean to be mysterious, but if we look at some of the symbols of the Sonoro, uh, Sonoro Club, there are a couple things that seem to be shown in particular in the diagrams of some of these here that um, so I'd like to point out very 
carefully because of the fact that uh, for me personally, I just do we need to watch some things here. But the point is, is that if you look at some of these images, if you look very closely, a lot of them are very intertwined with this idea of what we can call, um, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, asymmetry or, uh, you know, a, a broken symmetry, if you want to call it that. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that when you look, for example, at even at the turbines here, the turbines themselves seem to be reminiscent of that of what's called the Tesla turbine. Now, what's interesting about the Tesla turbine is that if we search up the Tesla turbine, it is a bladeless centripetal flow turbine that was patented by Tesla in 1913. It was his 100th patent. Here's what's interesting about this. Um, it essentially uses what's called the boundary layer effect, which in fluid mechanics is a thin layer of fluid in the media in the immediate vicinity of a bounding surface formed by the fluid flowing along the surface. So in other words, dare I say a shielding effect or a shielding layer occurs because of the way that this test, uh, this Tesla turbine tends to work and operate. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that there has been speculation that the Tesla turbine has actually been privately, particularly within the military and all that has been reintroduced for the use of, let's just say, alternative means of propulsion. Now, what's interesting about this as well is that when you look at the symbolism outside of the turbine, you see this idea of the vectors and the pine cones kissing once again in terms of the way that they tend to interact. Now, what's interesting as well is that if we follow along here where my mouse is, this would be the outer layers of a vector. We then have a straight, what would be called Lorentz force that is going and the arrows point outwards in which we see this sort of attraction repulsion mechanism occur. In addition to this idea, again, of a concave sort of setup leading to the center or zero point of the entire apparatus of this system or of this airship in general. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at the work of Salvatore Cesar Paez, the UFO Navy uh, gentleman there, some of his experiments uh, images of his experiments some years ago that were done by the Navy were either leaked on purpose or leaked online or what have you. And what's interesting is that pneumatic air compressors were also being used. So what's interesting here is that if we go to um, this website here, which is ch uh, chestofbooks.com, we see this idea of pneumatic, we could say valves and all of that, but it, and I quote, it has already been explained that air expands or has its elastic pressure increased by the application of heat and that its volume contracts, uh, contracts and its pressure becomes less by a decrease of temperature. So this idea of, again, compressed air, whether it's with the Tesla turbine, whether it's with, uh, uh, you know, um, for example, uh, J. Sterling's air engine, for which a patent in 1827 was obtained. Give me one second here. Uh, was there an image? Oh, I wish there was. But anyways, the point being is that there seems to be this sort of attempt to reintroduce a lot of this as quantum, if you want to call it, or other some other type of form. Now, what's interesting to to sort of wrap all of this up here is that regardless of the craft that are made here, you notice this, uh, this constant... Um, we could say uh, circling back to the platonic solids. In addition to as well, we see here, this kind of in a certain regard seems to be resemblant of the way that um, electromagnetic fluxes in a toroid field tend to operate. Uh, as we see here, sort of the two rings, the as above, so below. I mean, you name it, but as well as there have been uh, leaked diagrams of the alleged um, uh, Tic Tac, a UAP as it's been called. And allegedly there have been some speculation on the mechanics of how these things operate and what's interesting about all of this is that this diagram in general particularly with the oval and then the two smaller concentric rings inside of it which again speaks to fractality and all tend to align directly with some of these alleged designs now the final thing if i may that i would like to end with is that we see a direct similarity and correlation to these designs, give me one second here, my apologies, to the way in which a lot of these, here we go. Okay, so I'm just going to take a very quick screenshot here. This is from a paper out of Brazil having to do with generating anti-gravity fields. So if we look here at the way that these two concentric rings are inside the oval, let's remember that for a second. We notice as well that I'm going to just pull up this photo very quickly. It seems 
very similar to this right over here. Oh, where are you? Where did you go? Uh oh. Sorry, guys. Give me one, one second. I'm not sure why it, this is not. And Matthew, there we go. This Charles A. A. Dale Shaw on the work. Oh wow! You, so you see the similarities between the the concentric rings that are both inside of a larger one? Yes. Yes. So again, and again, we see the the chamber of air. We see these, you know, alleged, you know, air compressors being used at least di at least in this diagram or schematic, right? So, um, unfortunately, I didn't everything I've referenced in the last two minutes of my rambling. Uh, just for the audience, I didn't expect to to present it in this way before we recorded. Had I did, I would have prepped. But that's basically where my mind goes when I look at all of that. So. That's just that's just me. This is how we roll, and that's how it is. So, um, in the book, uh, the secrets of Del Shaw, which I highly mm. recommend, this uh, details this whole story about how they were come across by a guy named Pete uh, P. J. Navarro, <clears throat> P. G. Navarro rather, Pete Navarro, and in Houston, Texas, they were dumped. All those beautiful drawings that you see were dumped uh, in boxes in a landfill, and this dude was here and ran over and asked some other guy for him, and it's a whole crazy story. But one of the more interesting things is is that Pete Navarro went through this book and all the drawings and actually made his own from a technical perspective. And so this is one of the NB gas chambers that he talked about in there that propelled this thing. You have men for scale, but then also you have this black vault or reservoir. The shapes are interesting on them. And then the thought of something being poured or doused over that's a gas housing at the top. And that contained what was called the NB gas. And that was one of these things that whenever um, Peter Mingus, one of the club's founders, passed on, the gas went away. It was something that was just no longer available. Some speculate that it was through... Uh, extraterrestrial contact that he got those means but also something I wanted to mention in here as we're talking about this because we're just doing this on the fly and I love this shit this is one of the coolest conversations so far because yeah we didn't know we were gonna talk about this it, it is oh look there we go yep with this a couple more images here from Del Shell and this is Charles A.A. A. Del Shell's work uh, again highly recommend the book just because it's fat this stuff lights me up. I don't know what it is. It's so exciting about this. But I think steampunk, these badass dirigibles, and this is in the, you know, late 1800s. This is part of the 1867, 1896, 1897 flap. And they have documented drawings in here of people lowering lights uh, in the late mid to late 1800s from craft that were floating around. There's conversations of people that piloted these things that were just humans. Allegedly, they were just just folk, and they just stumbled across something and were maybe given some extra information. But the designs of these are fascinating. Here's another example, Dave, like you were talking about. And when you put these together, this asymmetry as well, this is one of my favorites. This actually was a desk yeah. of mine for a very long time. And it's this idea of these cross forces that are intermingled together and how they stack and rotate and well c c if i could just say very quickly there the, the designs are identical when they're orthogonal slash perpendicular to each other now what's interesting about this is that it, it's known in electromagnetism in general if you turn on actually i don't know how much in the system it's known but if you turn on an electromagnet say on your table just a simple electromagnet perpendicular to the feet to the actual electromagnet there's a, a field of potential that can then be tapped and used for energy, which is always perpendicular, which is seemingly something that seemed to be understood just based on the diagrams here. But that that's yeah. Almost like it was something discovered on accident. Like they were like, hey, we just had this thing running and then we had something sitting off to the side of it. Isn't that how infrared light was found? Yes, that is absolutely exactly how infrared light was found. Exactly. And, and, and uh, Brandon, I'm so sorry. If you can click on the, the second row far left photo. This one? Uh, no, run one down to the left. Right there, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Look, at if that. you look, if you look at uh, the side, what seem to be, I'm going to assume, propulsors, et cetera, et cetera. We see this concaveness. We see the concave uh, angles of such, uh, or the concave curves being, uh, what, what can I say, asympt asymptotic to each other, which essentially means it's it's curving, approaching what seems to be a flat intersection, but it never actually touches it. So, it, again, it. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. It's almost as if there was this fundamental understanding that regardless of how they designed the craft, they had to sort of follow this underlying geometry. Yes. Of that's what that's what it seemed like to, seems like to me. But dude, totally. This is something I've noticed with the work as well. It's that there were and it doesn't seem to be aerodynamic 
per se, right? It's not right. like you're designing fighter jets in a way that it's symmetrical, it's sleek as shit. You know, like you think of the Aviator movie where he was like, no rivets, I want it smooth. And that idea, but these are clunky. They look, you know, slow, but that's not how they were reported. And they right. could land on water. Uh, they could camp down for a little bit. Some, the goose, the original one, the spruce goose, um, made by Peter Mingus, the original founder, uh, it could sit on water, land. He had a little... He could take, he was like famous for people just coming up on him in fields, just sleeping in it. And um, <clears throat> another thing to notice here, Dave, is uh, as you were talking about this being this concave, this looks like an outer portion, if I'm reading this right. Okay, so we can say that this little area here is an outer shell and this inside whisk looking material here. Do you see this, these lines here? And it almost yes. looks like a whisk or a beater of some kind. But if you look at it the way it's oriented, it looks like it rotates this way. Yes. As it almost as if it's a, it's a self-feedback model, sort yes. of. Yes. Yeah. So as this spins internally, because this is powering it, it is a perpetual motion kind of a thing. But this also could be how you steer. If you think about it, if this is spinning and propelling you forward, you stop one of these, It would this one would keep spinning. Now you're going to turn in this direction. The same way like a dual prop rotor, uh, a rotor works on a helicopter. You just stop one and the other one's still spinning. So it's going to propel you in forward momen mo momentum. And it would probably have something to do with the wheels as well. I don't know how much ground travel they did with these, but I could say that, you know, this is probably just for landing and wheeling out. And then you inflate these and they were made of some sort of silk. The balloons were that they talked about. But everything about this has like lit up my imagination since I heard about it. And it's just one of these things that whenever you talk about this kind of stuff, I am just like, um, again, losing my shit on this because of how, like, look at this. There there were some they said that now, like, they fit a bunch of people I, on. Right, now for, for I, I just wanna say very quickly, I'm quoting off the top of my head here. So anyone that is listening, even, uh, yeah, anyone that is listening or watching, please comment below, uh, at least on my end, uh, on the Patreon, um, if, if I do have this incorrectly, but I have seen evidence uh, in fairness, anecdotal, but anecdotal evidence to suggest that essentially there were letters written back and forth between members of the Confederacy and Lincoln, et cetera, et cetera. And apparently um, it was stated at one time by, I think it was, I, this is the part where I'm probably going to get I'm probably going to butcher this, but I believe it was either George Washington or, or someone along during the shortly after the, the Civil War and all of that, the American Civil War. Um, it was discussed that uh, luckily the Confederacy did not have the airships because if they did, they would have won. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing there. It's a general quote, but um, I can pull it up afterwards for anyone interested. But uh, just wanted to see. Yeah, sorry. If you guys want to go on and then I have another a couple things to add on my end as well. well it's a that suggests that Sherman's march might have included airships. Yes. Well, that's I think that's what I think that's what we, what the the letter was referring to in in that context, I believe. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, man. Um, they around there was an issue, there was inner turmoil within the Sonora Air Club itself, which the, a lot of this takes place in Texas. This is uh, his brief uh, for Houston. Houston exactly. Now, I want to say as well, you see that cyclotron belt in the center of the craft yeah. there? Uh yes. Okay. yes, yes. That yes, is yes. I, that is identical to a Van der Graaff particle accelerator. So they're, they're basically they're like pulleys and shit. It's pu so basically the reason for the belt itself is to take the electrons and the protons and to essentially accelerate them along the belt through just friction. And then the particles then get brought to wherever they're needed to for uh, either attraction or repulsion in mixture with, you know, compressed air, the silk, the gases, yeah. etc. I don't know the, the details, but clearly this I, this concept of a particle accelerator. And then we see at the top, that top red wheel disseminating the particles within their respective right angle vectors to other parts of the craft and then transmitting those particles to the outer, we could say, um, uh, the outer turbines seem to be what they're doing. Dude, and it, it makes so much sense because as you're talking about this, knowing what I do about the story, there were compressed motors that they used, air compressed motors that were interesting. But again, this lighter than air tr travel. So what they did is they basically negated the weight, you know, and they talk about this and with that leading edge that they've admitted that they're using on the B-2 bomber, that they're, gl they're heating the edge and electrifying it so that there's a separation of molecules and so that it can glide through. So it's sort of like this electrostatic. Is that what we're talking about here? That is exactly, yes. <laughs> oh, yep. Electros, 
That's amazing. Another thing, just for everybody that's looking at this, this symbol up here, he used a lot of coded language. He was German. Uh, horrible speller, all those wonderful things. There's just an interest. This character is fascinating. The guy who did these. And uh, this is a code for Nimza, which was another aero club that was not so secret, but another one. So there were several factions of people working on this. This is just the story of the Sonora Aero Club and what Charles A. Right. Elschow, who's from Germany, by the way, which is important to the story, right? These German immigrants, which also right. was in Houston. Houston had a huge German immigrant population down there. Uh, when I lived down there, I lived off of roads such as Kirkendall and Telgi, like spelt with a G and all these things. It's all German influence out there. A lot of Texas, uh, German influence in Texas with Schlitterbahn and uh, New Bronzeville's and all that. I, I have to tell you, and I imagine some of my members, at least on my end, are probably going to be screaming saying, Dave, I know what it is because I genuinely don't, but I, I haven't actually looked into it. But the general history of why a lot of this came out of Germany or what was formerly, uh, you know, the what you could say that the Bavarian, I believe the Bavarian or Ottoman Empire, all that kind of stuff, this knowledge disseminating from the German geographical area as we know it, or what yeah. was once Pr uh, Prussia, if we want to yes. call it that. Um, I don't want to get into the history of this alleged back and forth of the you know Bavarians and uh, all these other things and all that stuff but th the point ultimately is that there seems to be a genuine dis whether it's the discovery of the transistor the discovery of uh, many other things even going all the way back to the or as as close as the early 1900s all seemed mostly to, to be discovered within Germany it was the center for uh Germany and Vienna as I understand it were up until World War II or just before were the hub for uh intellectual thought which was very interesting. So um, I just found that very peculiar myself. It's so interesting, dude. It's because personally I'm fascinating for me. My family is German and Irish, and my German, German side Irish. is, is uh, from Bavaria. Oh, wow. Well, I can tell you, I mean, look, and not to get not to sound all conspiracy or what have you, but whether it's the Max Planck Institute in Germany or whether it's the um, there are uh, f various facilities, I don't know whether public or not, but out of Bavaria, I know that it's still an ongoing thing. And I know Germany is a very strong hub still for scientific research. And I know that when scientists have issues getting papers published in North America for controversial reasons, a lot of times they'll publish in Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, okay, there's, Irish. yeah. I apologize. I got excited. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, was it Bulgaria or Bavaria that they had the crash that the Nazis allegedly found in 38? Was that Bav Bavaria or Bavaria? Oh. I, I don't want to say I don't it's a, that's a good question I don't remember but I know that uh I know that, that in that was particular one of the reason they went to Antarctica uh, it was a oh, it was, it was a whole thing because the, the the Germans called a new Schwabenland basically yes. yeah yeah Klaus um, Schwab's grandfather helped found the guy who's right to tell you that you own nothing and love it which is not yeah the it's Not just sure. interesting to see that bloodline linkage as well, to be fair. But uh, yeah, uh, Matt, sorry, did you want to jump in before I did another little ramble? <laughs> I wanted to actually ask you a question. Um, you said in passing, you mentioned the kissing pine cones. And I was really um, curious about what what you mean by that. And if you explain if you could explain to the audience what the implications of that uh, concept are. Sure. So the idea is, I'll phrase it as this concept of zero point. So this idea that when two pine cones, we could say, come together, and I don't mean actual pine cones, although it's been debated historically, it, pine cones are representative of such. This idea that when we take two Lorentz vectors, whether in physics, engineering, or math, and we make them, we could say, sum to a zero point where just the tips or the zero points of those vectors meet, there is an ability to tap a sort of back layer threshold of sort of like the way you you tap a you peel back the first layer of an onion it's it, allegedly there's this notion that our reality um as we observe and experience it is on one layer and that when we tap this zero point uh whether by getting practically these vectors that, from theoretical to practical engineering to sum to zero we can then pull back the fabric of this reality to either enter a void of space time or to enter another uh the idea of you know multi world multiple realities or to induce what's called um, a negative mass or energy so the idea would be that we'd have more than uh, a hand more than the current dimensions that we have so this idea that for example say um, I right over here in space-time just like a zipper on on your jeans I unzipped through say using um, electromagnetism uh, through the, the zero point I 
unzipped the fabric of space time just with in between my hands here. The idea is just like reaching into a bag. If I put my hand into it, you would not. The idea would be that you can't see it after I put my hand in. Yeah, like Mary Poppins so would, bag. Remember from the movie when she kept pulling lamps and shit out of it, even though. It was right, right. That would be right. That So we like would call that an extra bag. spatial, right, an extra spatial dimension. And so the idea behind the pine cones kissing is that when one can actually do that practically, whether for propulsion or for healing or for communication, you can enable, you can pull back those layers of an infinite onion and basically mess with space time. For now is that zero point is that is that the heart of uh a toroidal um electromagnetic field and yes that that's... every every living breathing uh being even you know planets celestial objects have an electromagnetic field around them that swirls inwards and outwards is that that point that you're referring to so the, the, exactly that also in school it's been taught that an electron spins, say, in one direction, for example, right? If an electron starts here, you apply a charge to something, an electron will go in a certain motion, if you will. But what's not taught in the schools is just like we talked about before with the electromagnet, there's an energy perpendicular to it that ex that can be tapped, but is not observable until you tap it. There's this idea that when the electron spins this way, there is also another anti-electron that comes from it that we cannot see but it's still there now it can be seen once the once the pine cones have kissed now a practical example of that would be if you take two nuclear fusers and you made the tips of those fusers uh like conical and you spun one fuser clockwise and the other one counterclockwise the idea is to induce enough uh, high energy frequencies that would you got to you got to back up because it'll kill you but the idea would be essentially to rip space time open the same way you unzip your you know a gene pocket that's that's the notion basically of, of the pine cones kissing now what you can do once you tap what people call it the quantum vacuum people call it the ether people call it exotic vacuum objects they call it the zero point energy different terms for the same thing in my humble opinion so once you tap that you can then manipulate and perturb the local reality like jello and then you can use it for a faster or speed of light communication. There's been speculation it could be used for faster than light propulsion, um, because the idea is if you're creating your own space time field within the craft itself, you're inducing basically um, an absolute value of the of the of the boundary you've established. So. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not breaking anything in Einstein's general relativity, but the difference between this is that Einstein's theory is has to do with relativity, not with absolute creation at the zero point. Mm -hmm. So that that's the that that would be the idea, basically. Um, but did you guys want to jump in? Uh, Dude. Yeah. So while you were talking here, I was looking up some stuff as well. And Matt, I didn't want to step on you though. Please go ahead. No, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm flabbergasted by what I'm hearing. This is great. Sorry, Matt. Sorry oh, if I, that, that was, sorry if that was all over the place, but when pine, when the pine cones kiss as, or the, the zero point is tapped, it, it's an unlimited set of possibilities basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's fascinating. Brandon, go for it. Isn't that crazy? I love all of this. And it makes things more simple. When Dave starts to explain it, it blows your mind. But then you're like, hang on, you can do this in a myriad of ways. And this can be accessible yeah. through all sorts of different avenues. And that's the takeaway I get from this is because there's so much to the information Dave presents, but it's so it's whimsical as fuck. You know what I mean? It's just like, hang on. So a pocket dimension. And then you bring in like the Mary Poppins idea. And then now you're talking Sumerian bags. And maybe that's what it was. It was sort of more of a temporal. Is that what Dan Winter was talking about? It's more of a te temporal. There's some that have proposed. I mean, if I was traveling, for example, and in, 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 at interstellar distances, I would want a mobile compact apparatus that yes. I can, that is a space time manipulator that I can then reach into for whatever I would like. Totally. That, that would be my thing, but that's just, yeah. Dude, are you I, suggesting that's what the Sumerian bags are uh, symbolizing? That's my personal humble theory. I could be extremely dead wrong, but yes. Mm -hmm. that, that's what my thought is on it as well. It's something that you could just grab anything from because I've thought of this. I'm like a time traveler, you know, in the movies or something like that, like uh, the time machine or something, they're dependent on an apparatus, on a physical 
right. that they need to be either in proximity of or have on their person and can't mm. lose or get destroyed or damaged or anything. Now, that's not how I would travel through time. I would not be like, oh, okay, so this little thing that's in my hand, why won't you embed it in me? You know what I mean? Like make it put it in my ass or something, you know, so I have access, <laughs> access to it. And so it's not, I'm not going to get lost or like get captured and don't have it. You know, when I think of like that guy from Torrid or whatever, that, um, I don't know if you guys heard that story. It was a long time ago. The man from Torrid, he showed up, um, in Japan with a passport from a co country called Torrid and he was trying yes. to get home and yes. put him in a hotel for the evening. And when they came back, it was heavily guarded. When they came back, he was gone. And so this would be this. an example, in my opinion, of temporal um, uh, of temporal uh, travel, for lack of a better term. Yeah, because then think about like if you had that, you could basically have a zipper or something or you get in the bag. And then that is your, you know, there's it, my my humble theory on that. In that particular, I know that case very well. My humble theory is that he whether he knew it or not is, a, is another debate. But I believe he was he was traveling through time, not space. You know, and I've, I've heard it that way, but also another fun way to think about it is it's an extra landmass. Like it's an extra bit of right. land on the flat, expansive, whatever the hell this thing is, it's more land and the motherfucker had a passport. There's been also a suggestion to your point, Brandon, that the same way, for example, like in Grand Theft Auto, a part of the map will glitch in a video game, for example, uh, from say another level or something yeah. like this, that that same kind of concept or uh, angle may have occurred there. Think about that shit. You're just walking through the woods or whatever, and all of a sudden a glitch occurs in the game that you're in that you don't know that you're in consciously. And then all of a sudden you're in a country that your country and world doesn't say exists and a world that proves that your world isn't the same as everybody says exists. And so how right. do you quantify that? Would you think that you were in the same landmass in a different time? And maybe this is like what the Al Belik story is about him falling off of the USS Eldridge during the um, Philadelphia experiment and him and his brother, remember, I don't know if you know that story well, but uh, they've fell out of time while it was traveling and ended up in the future his he ended up like 200 years in the future his brother ended up somewhere else uh, and and then he was able to come back but he was shown a map but it was different than ours and it had like water that was filled in in places that it wasn't like california was underwater and things like that but if you think about it if you were shown a map of a place that you didn't recognize and on a globe or an earth where they were just like no no, no it's an expensive endless reality dude they don't tell you all that in the in the dumb dumb part oh, okay well that's why we call you all that you know it's an interesting thing whenever you start to think about this but this idea of being stranded when you have the ability to traverse in that way has always been silly to me it's it's the same argument for people who say well you know ufos they come from so far away it would take so much energy why would they do that and the, the answer obviously is, is because it's not hard for them, right? And so you're anthropomorphizing what we would do as humans. We would look at it like a scarcity thing, like, oh my God, we only have enough rocket fuel because this is how we're doing it. We can only get so far. We needed this to survive. They don't think of things like that. Their world doesn't work like that. And so you're seeing this. And so really what I feel we're doing is we're opening our ability to perceive possibilities of what other entities around here just know, like, nothing they're just like yeah duh you guys you guys pay for shit like what is what is this taxes like pedophiles are running your show what are y'all doing here yeah this is like well this this to me speaks to this idea that allegedly these beings have been called extra temporals yeah. more than anything else because of the fact that they claim that allegedly not all but some have claimed they traveled here through time and not space so it's a whole different situation that we'd be looking at essentially time having to do with uh entropy and all of that so it, it becomes a very interesting thing to to to, to think on it it's very difficult to grasp uh, and if anyone grasps it easily that's fantastic but at least for me at least at first it was difficult to grasp but um just wanted to see if i could jump in for another minute if that's cool yeah, please dude yeah yep. this is all right we're just in it aren't we i know the audience yeah well not. this is this is interesting because i found another website about the the sonora oh, club I and the designs guys work i love now what's interesting stuff. is that this idea of again a lift power harnessing device but notice i, I want to point out some very interesting things we notice for example on the left hand side similar drawings and and designs to that of ancient structures and all of that but in particular here we find that at the center we see a connection to this sort of tapering that is also very similar to the, the tesla's um, plasma tubes and all of that there was this sort of a uh, klein bottle tapering but this tapering leads to concave setups of 
I, what, I, I'm not sure exactly what, but they're identical to what the Department of Energy's quantum communication program over the next 10 years that Facebook and other big companies are working on are setting up. It's, it always has to do with concave transmitters and receivers, almost as if you're completing a full half of a circle by putting one half on one and one on the other, which is the same thing with the electron half integer spin. So I'm pretty sure they're moving elect. I'm certain they're moving photons and electrons. Now, what's interesting if we move over to the revolving generator is I must say as well, this reminds us of the Nazi black sun symbol, but this also reminds us as well of an this this curvature of an of the Fibonacci sequence that never ends, basically. And so what you have are in the center four vectors which is identical in in physics to taking four polarizations of a photon but within those vectors there are essentially sub vectors if you want to call it so we have four larger ones and then we have again one two, we then have eight uh smaller ones in a certain way so we we see over and over this i guess you could say that these particles behaving and conforming uh, not behaving but conforming to this curvature of things whether it's concaveness or whether it's this sort of Fibonacci induction of the rotation of this wheel or generator. We see again here, for example, this is a very basic, the way I see it, this is a Lorentz force vector, so to speak. If you wanted to make another version of this, you would take this and flip it on the other end, and it would give you a pine cones kissing type scenario, which is also equally as interesting. So, I mean, we, we can just, I mean, we looked at this one, of course, but I mean, if we keep going, we just see that same geometry occurring over and over. And finally, uh, one other thing I wanted to point out as well is this here. So we see all over these designs, by the way, there's these like sort of tapering in and out, which speaks to like a, an ebb and flow of like the caduceus, you know, your DNA strands, the way that waves tend to work, you know, they pinch in, they pinch out sort of like a, a Z pinch type scenario. But what's interesting here is that if you look at the motion in which the air presses tend to move in they're overlapping each other they're rings over rings which speaks to the interference patterns of things this also speaks to the double slit experiment because that's how you induce the experiment this also speaks to i mean what when you for example um uh, uh brandon when we were doing the placing ring magnets over each other rings yeah. over rings whether you do it electrically magnetically you name it there always needs to be some type of interference or phase conjugation where the particles essentially integrate and make love to one another rather than fight because if they fight then they end up causing what we call explosions right. but if you see these rings here they're overlapping one another and i personally don't think that's a coincidence but anyways so that's yeah that's kind of where i stand on this god i love this wow. so much matthew so, what sorry one last thing what i mean by tapering just to point out very quickly is to give an idea is if we see the bottom here there's this, the flux tends to taper, which allows for more of a, a pulse or um, an impulse on the other end, because it can then pinch out much more, uh, we could say, implosively, explosively via the implosion, if that makes sense. The same way the pyramids did it, mm -hmm. they would let it taper right to the tip of the cone of the pyramid, and then shoot up in its most compressed form, because that's how you amplify the energy resonance most significantly. That's, yeah, so now i'm done dude it's it's amazing and i'm gonna pick up where you are with this i've thought of this as an example sort of for the expansion of consciousness this idea of this gourd reality to where let's say we enter through the bottom here if we take just one of these gourds uh, as an example uh here this is a fine example okay let's say that you take this this is what i feel like the expansion of consciousness is by the way let's say that this is sort of um i'm already with you fully yep <laughs> let's say that this is human centipeded onto another larger one and then that, that is human centipeded onto another larger one and they're like the matryoshka dolls yes like matryoshka yeah. dolls but lay down in a series of that i feel more easily articulatable for the experience itself and what it feels like which is why i'll, I'll use this as the example what it feels like is that you come in through this area, right? Like now picture this all hollow in here, okay? And these are cavities that are just hollow cavities, but inside these cavities are experiences, their knowledge, their wisdom, and you yourself come in here at the top as a little soul and you bounce around and your job is to fill this container, to fill this space, to expand, to find out what the breaches of this cavity hold for you as a spirit, as an enlightened being. Now, when you do that, you inevitably pick up perhaps some things that 
weren't meant to move on to the next screen just like you did to enter. You had to get to a level to enter this thing to where you release a bunch of shit because how I view this is that there are fine mesh screens at the juncture of the next level up if you want or into the next expanse. And your job or our inclination is to elevate into these and to continue to fill up and to fill these voids as we go on and to explore the refuge of those as they continue on. But this mesh screen right here has a vibrational threshold to it. Now, some people will get stuck here forever. They will say, you know what, yes, the government's full of shit, but I'm gonna sit right here and yell at everybody about how it's full of shit and not do anything else about it. But if you can get through that and you can pass through the screen of releasing a bunch of fear, of releasing a bunch of the stuff in you that can't go with you, uh, mm -hmm. it's all mental, by the way, this is a personal journey anyone can take, then you're allowed to pass through and fill this other void where the fear of the government and all that stuff doesn't exist. You have an awareness that what's going on is not what they're telling you, but you don't fear it anymore because you've elevated beyond this and expanded your consciousness into a new void vessel here. But this is a never ending thing, you know, I feel. Now, um, this is just one of the references I use uh, for this expansion type of a deal. But then if you can picture this again, manipulating it to flip one on itself. So what if you do, instead of expanding this way, you invert it and you have two that are facing each other. What does that look like? That's expanding an in infinity, right? Infinity. Or it's a simulation, which means that the next level, the next thing after this is blocked off and that we're sort of trapped in this a uh, never-ending loop of just expanding back and forth from major masculine energy back to a little bit here and then through the other side, which would be visualized here, into a little bit less, but now major feminine energy. And maybe it's this ping back and forth, this infinite infinity loop between these expanses of filling these cavities and moving on. I don't know. This is just something I think about. That, is, that makes perfect sense with the way that even in general, the energy has to flux because in order for it to move onwards, there needs to be a compression in order for there to be an expansion. Yeah. Mm. So when you talk about that climb bottle, that curve that's noted in all of these things, and maybe this is too fat or thick of an example, but you look at this, this is a traditional structure. You know, if we talk about like the, what you're talking about in these architectural structures, I mean, Matt, you've seen this in nodes and tops of buildings, these spires, and it still follows that conical shape that, you know, harnesses the power of the energy of whatever the hell we're talking about here. Well, I see, that's explain. that's where I wanted to go with this. Ultimately, um, <clears throat> I'm fascinated by this idea of, you know, taking this technology and applying it to motion. But, you know, as an architect, at the end of the day, all this, the sum of all forces has to equal zero. Mm -hmm. We're looking for stillness. And yet I'm convinced that this old world architecture was doing something whether yeah. it was um sorry yeah. if i could say matt and i say this in the most kind way possible it is of my view that uh, when you said we're looking for at the, the zero point we are but i believe it is a common misunderstanding that we're not looking for stillness we're looking to tap the zero point for the motion behind this layer of stillness hmm so actually just, matthew is looking for stillness because they oh they, sorry they, sorry they, i i apologize i thought i thought no, you were wait, talking right. i'm sorry matt i thought you were talking in my, my line my field sorry sorry my you're, bad you're both oh. right we'll, i'll buffer here because that's the key is that matt matthew was saying that a still building is what he has been taught in architecture is required a zero sum right but again it has right. to stand up essentially yeah i'm right. so i i deeply okay, apologize right, right. i thought you were talking propulsion sorry oh <laughs> No, well, that's what that's what I uh, what is so fascinating to me about this is because um, you know I I believe that architecture is an expression of the consciousness of the age it comes out of, and everything that goes with that, and so the the, the technologies that we're looking at and these drawings that are so fantastical but appear to be diagrams of this advanced understanding of 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 science and tech yeah like it it looks like this could be you know. Um, on the one hand from a comic book series, but then when you start describing it the way you do, Dave, I'm realizing these are incredibly advanced diagrams of a profound understanding of elemental um, um, forces at work, and but it's describing motion. And so my question is looking at this idea of antiquitech and how old world architecture might have functioned, the building is still, the sum of all forces equals zero, but I, I have to, um, begin to accept that this same level of consciousness went into those buildings, the same level of technology of advanced understanding of elemental forces went into a cathedral right. as went into this. And so when we look at this question of antiquitech, how, like, how is, how is it working? Like, and that's the question I ask myself all the time. 
as an architect, how how are you know we look at these antenna and spires that are going up into the heavens, um, and this idea that they're pulling down etheric forces, or this idea of um, how are these gigantic uh, masonry structures being heated before you know there weren't wood burning fireplaces and you know heating up cathedrals or castles or what have you that's really not practical uh mm. so are these radiant fireplaces actually functioning and if so h- how right well i think Fire a lot of it from an architectural perspective was a piezoelectric induction in my opinion i think a, i think a good chunk of it was piezoelectrically induced um and then the rest of the structure was magnetically inducing a sort of uh, boundary effect so the electricity had a sort of uh, a body that it knew it could travel within and as as a boundary so to speak mm-hmm. if that makes sense that that's my interpretation of the architectural side it's basically the same principles as the propulsion except different approach to get the same underlying source uh, for various purposes that and so by piezoelectric we're we're talking about certain atoms when they're pressed put into compression they produce charge and they also they charge. produce they well uh, well when certain materials are compressed uh-huh. um they produce a voltage so a potential difference which then in depending on what you want to do uh, architecturally and even in an engineering regard whether it's for craft or for buildings that voltage that potential difference can then be induced if needed to then in, uh, turn into a charge that essentially would then in the case of architecture travel along just the same way that you get a particle to accelerate travel along a p- particular path either uh, a, an electrostatic path or a uh, a magnetic flux path essentially so, it, so those uh um charges could in practical terms be used to create a heating element let's say Oh, absolutely. I mean, you want it to heat your home. Sure. Yeah. You now, can get the charges to then come to then say compress into a particular area, say like the what you would normally have as a fireplace, but mm-hmm. with a different setup that would enable the charge to then innate to then have a, uh, to then have heat resistivity and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, we also look at the idea of a crystal radio where putting crystals under pressures in order to receive a signal. So, for instance, can we begin to look at obelisks? for instance, right. or, or cathedrals themselves as uh, receivers. Well, it's interesting to, to your point. You notice the similarity in geometrical structure of an obelisk and say like a Vogel crystal. Hmm. Right. There's this there's this tapering between the two that seems to have to do with either this idea of grounding, attaching to another living body or system, whether it's an obelisk being grounded to the earth or whether it's a Vogel crystal being uh, held by someone in their by someone's hand uh where the you know again the human body being conductive in that certain regard we see the similarities of this tapering whether it's at the bottom of the obelisk or the crystal or at the top there's a tapering nonetheless um almost as if again the tapering has to confine to that sort of z pinch type scenario where you can either transmit or receive electricity so short answer yeah hmm. You know, it's fascinating too. They call it terminated. Uh, The ends on crystals, when they do that naturally, they're called naturally terminated ends. Right here. Interesting, because you think of the word terminated, I think over, I think done, I think end of simulation, maybe. Uh, Right. Delusion. And look here, you have more cone type stuff. And I wanted to point this out uh, as we come back to it here. Now I'm looking at these different with all the cups and the arches. And something I noticed in all of the drawings, uh, other than the ones that we saw, most a high percentage of the drawings have wheels like this that are these concave type uh, half cones, right? These cups. And then it's more interesting too because they have them and they're used as propulsion devices or um, they spin. And so this is an interesting correlation as well. Now I'm looking at these completely differently as well. The cupped bottom here, you know, why would you do that? It's a more stable base. They built a flat platform here. You know, cut bottoms, I mean, for what, aerodynamics? We're not concerned about it with the ice cream cones going on? Well, here. this is, if I could say very quickly, if you could zoom into one of the cones, uh, Brandon, sure, say that one there. Say, the, 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 say let's start at the bottom of it. Um, of the, let's go down more. That's cool. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So we see at the bottom, there's almost as if there's this straight line that goes through all of the... Um, of the of the whole let's just call it ice cream cone if you want to call it that we see this line going through it now the question is does this line is it 
piezoelectric? Is it electrostatic? Does it enable the ability for electromagnetic or even just electric transportation the same way a cyclotron belt does? Now, what's interesting is that if we, sorry, if we scroll down a little more, Perfect. Thank you. If let's start at the very bottom of the cone, the very, very bottom uh, right there. Perfect. So now imagine you see that little that straight line. There's almost like this cat, this gap in between the entire cavity that lets you get out, that lets the line go to the next uh, uh, cavity. What you're doing is you're enabling a, essentially electron proton resonances within the cavity and only that we could say cyclotron belt can then take the electrons and protons and bring them to the next one. So this speaks oh, to your Matryoshka dolls. Because they're confined within the belt. That's your pinch. Right? Yes. And that's you your res. That's you running through it to it, pull them. Yes. It, literally. Yes. It's yes. A, oh, my God. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You see it now? Yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah. it's like simple. It's simple, simple. You pull, you pull the, uh, actually, let me see if I can. Is just that what the I, cups are? They're literally grabbing, <laughs> scooping electrons and like kind of cupping them like you would water, like fluid. I hope I can find the same, the same one that you have there, brother, because I want to just use my mouse very quickly to show. Um, and then would you be able to? Yeah, yeah. Something to note here is how they connect. So this is, you know, your invisible line that you're talking about. Here's another open here, open end part here that would run this up. Here looks like a pulley or another open part here and then runs through some sort of device, which again looks like from here, it looks a little easier to see, but it looks like a stabilization or some sort of bar. And then it also up, but you have this sort of rope that goes up through that connects to both and then back down. So is this thing cycle connected i believe so so if we see for example uh, the first cavity the, um the idea is hold on one second let me see very quickly if i can find even yeah, can, oh let me drop it in the chat sure thank you and even by the way we can also use the um, uh i don't mean to confuse anyone but we can even use here for example the vimanas to if we take a look yes. what the, oh where did oh where God. did that go I didn't even think about the Vimanas, man. Well, if we look, for example, I don't know how the heck what just happened there, but I could have sworn I had the Vimanas for a you second. Did, at least. Uh, you did. Yeah. So, on. yeah. How did that happen? Anyways, let me let me stop sharing because I don't want to waste any time. Let me go back to the. Uh, oh, perfect. The picture. Thank you. Fantastic. So if we look here. OK, here we are. So the idea is essentially this. The particles initially are started here there then we could say cycle to the other we could say cycles here and I, I would imagine this is something they would generally leave out of the of the diagram it's interesting to see the light sort of hints at it at it potentially but the idea would be essentially that you bring the particles into their cavities and they bounce and they stay re bouncing they never go away there, there's a constant resonance until slash unless this cyclotron belt brings it through the cavity to the next one so there's a constant transportation, but there's also a constant resonance. So you then have the belt bringing the resonance to the next one. And so the particles from here then come to this one, then go to this one and then repeat. And then it goes back up again. And then the cycle repeats. So if it builds infinitely, how do you get them out? Or does it scoop on a recycle so that you stay? The idea, it's a scooper. That would be the idea. Because then, depending on, I suppose, how much particles or how many, like, let's call what what they were filling this with was probably that NB gas that they talked about. So let's say that the particles that they were using were this gas, and they were filling it. Now, the amount of gas would then have created pressure in there, right? And then the resonance, because of the quality of the gas, you know, negated the weight or made it anti-gravitic. So are you saying that then, depending on how much they pumped into it was how anti-gravitic, which would mean altitude control or this, this, I don't know necessarily anti-gravitic as much as it would be, uh, what would be called, um, I, ion, ionospheric levitation. There is a difference. Yeah. Um, this has been known as what's also been called like the same things that powered the airships, uh, allegedly not so much anti-gravitic as much as, uh, we could say lighter than air or LTA. Um, we could say design. And the reason I say that is because uh, not to be stingy, but when one says anti-gravity, we have to consider that you're either uh, 
you're either creating your own gravity wave or field, or you're using the local gravitational fields to push or pull against them. And in my humble opinion, that's neither of those still extremely advanced. It is a form of ionospheric propulsion, basically. So cool. Perfect. Yeah, you'd have you'd have because it would be this can also be called uh, electrostatic confinement as well. So these are all things still that are completely uh, uh, dismissed from our t- typical literature because of the fact that they induce self-sustaining effects, yeah. which then, you know, again, you don't need to rely on a system. You don't rely on a system. You don't have to pay taxes. And, you know, so. Man. But there are different types of of propulsion in which I think th- it is of my humble view based on just the diagrams without actually knowing the history. So I want to be fair and clear about that. But I think it's, I believe it's electrostatic slash ionic uh, push pull type situation here more than anything else. And then the ga- then the chambers would then fill up the actual balloons themselves in uh, assuming these are even balloons. It's possible maybe a, uh, maybe a a aluminum casing perhaps yeah Yeah, something like that yeah they seem to have a frame you know bound but it seems that it can inflate is what it looks like that's what it's right so i want to be careful because i'm just speculating but if i had to if i had to wager on how this if i had to make a bet which i i'm not a betting person but if i had to on how this worked purely based off images no descriptions and just diagrams i would probably bet on that You know, I'm wondering too what, because they did say specifically in there um, that it was made of silk. And I know that the frequency of fabrics is very important. We switched to linen sheets. I highly recommend everybody do it. Um, And so I'm wondering if the, because of the silk nature of it, uh, frequency of silk is about 15 and polyester non-cottons is about 70. So it's real low, um, a low frequency. So maybe there's your... I don't know, low frequency. It's it, it had something to do with the material they use because I, I know that I remember reading silk. I mean, my God. And so it was a very specific yeah. thing that they used for that, but also maybe it had to, to do with the ability to resonate. Um, let me see something here. One second. Uh, oh, this is interesting. According to, I'm going to share my screen very quickly yeah. uh, as it pertains to silk. Among other things, the present invention encompasses the recognition that silk materials can exhibit oscillatory behavior via piezoelectricity, much like quartz. Fucking When when mechanical stress is applied, silk is capable of generating electric charge, which may then be captured the same way they captured it in the diagrams that I think the way they did it, the way we just looked at. I think this easily just became the best... Sonora Aero Club Charles Delshaw breakdown uh, and never heard because you're applying the modern day work that you're doing with this and you're taking your look at it. I dig the shit out of this, man. And I appreciate it. I'm just looking at it in the way that I understand a lot of the modern stuff in terms of what they call quote unquote quantum. And it just seems like a honestly just like a uh, an attempt at whether for better or worse regurgitation or regurgitating a lot of this. So, yeah, yeah. You know, I found something that um, I don't know, Matt. Are you? Are you? What are your thoughts on all this, Matt? Um, well, what what just occurs to me again and again is is how incredibly advanced um, our ancestors' knowledge of elemental forces was, yeah. and how much we've lost in this modern age. And, yeah, and 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 how much it feels like we're just on the precipice of of reclaiming. Um. Uh, uh, you know, like this is our heritage. This is our uh, birthright to have this knowledge and apply it to the human condition to elevate everything and just to bring us out of this morass that we're in. So I'm well, looking at it. <laughs> if I could say actually very quickly to both of your points, whether it's architecture or even meditation or propulsion or what have you, it's it's interesting because what we just looked at, by the way, is a concept that is actually in our phones as we speak, which is the piezoelectric element. Mm. The piezoelectric element utilizes within our phones something called MEMS, M-E-M-S, microelectromechanical systems. So why is it that it's it can be applied in our phones, but nowhere else, whether it's in buildings, whether it, in literally in the no pun intended, in the building blocks of Mm. these buildings, literally, or these structures, or in other things, again, is something that is, you know, not for me to, to, to tell anyone what to think. So, 
dude. It's just interesting. They put it in one thing and then it's just, it's not put in anywhere else. And it's in so. watches. I know that watches have little yep. crystals in them and then they don't have a battery. And so everybody oh. is okay with this, which is fascinating to me. It's like, okay, so you don't, you have a watch and they're like, no, 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 it's got a crystal in it. You don't need to power it at all. And, well, and the same, the same way on your phone, when you, when you, yeah. for example, whether it's an Android or an iPhone, a lot of phones these days, when you touch the screen, you feel that sort of vibration, acknowledging that you've tapped that particular part of the phone. That's piezoelectric. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's using it. That's using a voltage potential difference. So it can be put in the phones, but it can't be put. You see what I'm saying? Because it's working off not maybe necessarily your heat, but your voltage. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, the pressure is create the pressure creates. Well, first off, the voltage is already the voltage is there, which means the potential for it to happen is there. What happens is essentially the pressure en enables the charge, Got which it. then gives you that the, what's called the haptic feedback. Haptic, on the phone that's right like the haptic uh, vest or something that you can wear exactly so if we go haptic piezoelectric effect i mean when like let's just just to confirm so everyone knows i'm not talking out of my ass here when powered the molecules align in a direction that elongates the film creating the piezoelectric effect bonding or integrating the actuator to a rigid substrate transforms actuator elongation into an out of plane vibration creating the haptic effect. It's piezoelectric. Yeah. So. What also it, occurs to me is that all this type of energy, um, I don't know the technical terms for it, if it's uh, just energy production or energy uh, capture transference, um, but all of this can be done without explosion, explosive um, processes. We don't need this, this is the blowing this is up and, and, and having piston, you know, piston engines and this kind of thing. And that's exactly what I was uh, trying to say earlier. When you get the particles, whether the photons, the electrons, the protons, the neutrons, you name it, you get them to, dare I say, make love or phase conjugate. There is an actual addition via implosion that is not then explosive. It's centrifugal, but it creates a whole new other form like the Mat Matryoshka dolls that are fractal. If you get them to fight, you then cause you create what we know as explosions. Hmm. Basically, it's basically it's the same idea as when two humans hug versus when they punch each other. When you punch each other, you're both going to knock each other down. When you hug, you're going to become something different. Two becomes one. At, at the risk of taking this in another direction, can I ask you a question then? Sure. Um, we have these two. These two. We have implosive and explosive um, energy production. Let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, where where does a dynamo like the 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 old dynamos that they showed off at the world fairs that. Um, Let's say at the Chicago World's Fair, the dynamo that was powering it, which doesn't get enough attention in this research um, field, it produced more than three times amount the amount of electricity as all of Chicago uh, at, at that age. Um, so, one, if you don't mind, if I could take advantage of your of your um, uh, your your expertise here, Dave, can you explain how those dynamos worked? what the relationship was to tesla and also like yeah we're on that we're on that um spectrum did oh, they buy, were they implosive or explosive type sure of very simple the whether it's the dynamos or whether it's um what we were looking at or whether it's um uh, uh yeah whether it's any of that kind of stuff from back then what was used back then that was largely suppressed was this idea of electrostatic mechanical uh particle acceleration so essentially Back then, the methods used were were uh, mechanical versions of scraping your foot on the carpet and touching the doorknob. We have since moved away from that very strongly because particle accelerators induce what are called now quantum effects. So there seem to have, I don't mean to get conspiratorial, but to your point, the amount of energy being outputted versus inputted was substantial, uh, yet a lot of over unity devices back then, which enabled perpetual motion, which spoke to, which violated a bunch of physics laws, but it, it was there and it worked. And so this idea of the, the difference in general is that we went essentially from a uh, mechanical static uh, mechanical electrostatic mechanisms like the homopolar motor for example two things for example like just storing charge inside of a lead acid battery that's the difference so when you store energy inside of say a battery you're not the, the charge isn't going anywhere it's just it's just staying within the, the confines of the battery itself. But in the case of what they did back then, they were taking the, the electrons, the, the protons, all of that, and they were cycling it through an entire system, whether it was a craft or a building. 
Nowadays, we just go, oh, no, look, we got to replace the battery and that's it. We think it's as simple as that. There was this understanding back then of recycling the energy. And to substantiate what I'm saying there, if we look very quickly at how the dynamos worked back then, notice even in this particular image, there was this cycling. Oh, I don't know where this went, but we see here, for example, there was this cycling of the charge. You see what there was a mechanical electrostatic transference, Mm -hmm. whereas today we would replace this with a battery. Wow. The batteries don't move charges. They just keep electric charge inside of them. It's like the idea of a hydroelectric dam, which is just the picture to the left there, that the idea is the water right. is always flowing. It's a physical representation of what we can't see in the ether, but the water's always flowing. Mm-hmm. So if you have something there that can spin and capture it, you can utilize it. In other words, okay. motion, basically, constant right. motion, essentially, right? So if you had, even for example, you had people that have created uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, over unity machines, meaning you're getting far more energy coming out than what you're putting in. And the way that they, all they had to do was give the initial push of, say, a bike wheel that mm-hmm. they would have attached to the system. Uh, th- this, by the way, would be a, a homopolar motor concept where there's this constant spin and the spin picks up the friction from the wood. And then it it keeps it moving in a circular motion on the actual uh, disc itself. That's the idea. So we've gone from t- constant motion of mechanical motion to then convincing society that, well, that's the old way of doing things. When in reality, it's now what they're calling quantum in a more scaled up version and went to, oh, we just got to store stuff in batteries. So, so if I could take this question one step further, what I keep coming up again against again and again in this research of you know what I consider old world cities in America is mm. that the earliest iterations of so many of these cities had electric trolley systems, and so whether I'm out in, you know studying Port Townsend, um, which is in a very remote location, or I just was in uh, uh, Durango, Colorado for a project. And I just went around the downtown and I looked and sure enough, you know, that if you look at the placards in downtown Durango, they show an electric trolley system in something like 1889, right? And it, and the town is just, you know, the Hollywood description of these towns is just, you know, uh, cowboys and, 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 and wood shacks and, and, you know, it's just, you know, the, the great fire of that particular town right. just around right. the corner because everything was made out of woods. Yeah, they had these electric trolley systems, and nobody ever really talks about this now. Concept, this research field, these right? Dynamos, as I understand, were powering these things. This is incredibly advanced stuff. Oh, there's footage I have, by the way, uh, from uh, the 1930s, where it showed in America an engineer, or the 40s, an engineer was able to do, uh, it was again, had to do with constant motion of mechanical electrostatic charge. He was able to power an entire town in Detroit for free. Like just because it never stopped. Now, what if we think of let's go back for a moment and think of the Matryoshka dolls and the fractality of things. What if these so what if the dynamos powered the the um, the trolleys, the trolleys excess power sent it back to the dynamo. So it self sustained it. But then the rest of the power itself was transferred to another town or city. So you have multiple towns or cities now working off of each other for constant power it's the same thing um electromagnetically as putting a microphone to a speaker and getting a non-stop squeal yeah feedback you know the particles generate the field the field allow the particles to fluctuate and repeat 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 but it's the smart way to do it matt you as an architecture you would love this type of infrastructure it's, guys it, it, sorry to cut you off it's it's identical to like when you're both when you're riding um let's say all three of us are riding a, a one big bicycle I go, holy shit, guys, I need a break. Brandon picks up the speed a little bit because I need a break. And then Brandon needs a break. And then Matt picks up where where Brandon left off. But by the time Brandon is, uh, needs a break, I'm ready to go again. It's an adorable it, analogy. It's a, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing over and over. You just It's constant, constant cycling. Good. So the implication of, of this, and, I, and I, I really am getting to a point where I feel like as a research community, we need to begin to synthesize this understanding. Yes and raise this whole conversation up a couple of notches and say here here's the new reference point we had electric trains that ran by dynamos that use this technology that you're so eloquently explaining it's real they had it then 
And then it went away because, you know, the new iteration of the grid had to be rolled out and shoehorned into. And the argument ultimately to your point, Matt, is to actually sorry to add to your point is we can take it one final step further and say that if we really think about it, the when we look at the biophysics of the human body, if we truly we are perpetual motion over unity devices. And what I mean by that is the same way over unity means you get far more coming out than what you're putting in. Everyone has had a situation where they've had one day where they've eaten very little, but still were able to function during the day. If we were a closed circuit or closed loop system, we would be dead by the time we ran out of calories. You see what I'm saying? So the fact that there's this constant and even people that can get energy from just walking in water, you know, uh, without having to eat, we are over, we are free energy over unity uh, machines in and of ourselves. And the best way to hide it is in plain sight. So, yeah, yeah, that that's that's the that's I mean, it's all going there. This quantum stuff all has to do with, you know, oscillations the same way a spring does, et cetera, et cetera. You're, we're going back to the same thing that was cracked over a hundred years ago, but various elements chose to suppress. Um, and it's been shown as well. Unfortunately, it only takes two generations of people to wipe out uh, societal memory. Which would be right. what the foundlings were possibly about. Those hundreds right. of thousands of children uh, that they just sort of shipped across the country with no explanation of who they were, or where they were from. That's what oh, research was for. Probably, yeah. probably going to cap it here in a little bit, right? Brilliant. I was actually going to say I myself in the next couple of minutes, yeah. I have to get going, unfortunately. Yeah, that's OK. Well, I wanted to, if you don't mind, apprehend the last couple of minutes to make a couple of points and we'll roll out. So one of the things I wanted to show out was the 38 crash that we talked about. There was actually one a little earlier in 33 that. Uh, so this is the damn it. I had it. OK, in Lombardy. Now, Lombardy is, um, of course, just right there in Italy. And this was found by Mussolini in 33. So if you know this, uh, I'm sure you guys do, but um, it, Lombardy is not far away from Germany. We're talking nine hours as a crow flies, right? So if a UFO originated from here and then ended up somewhere over here, landed, Mussolini's like, ha ha, got your frisbee. We are not giving it back. You know, it's kind of like uh, the frisbee got thrown into the yard and he's like, I'm not doing it, dude. It's fucking I'm sorry, hard. Brandon. That sounded a bit more German than Italian. It, more German. Was, it was him. It was Mussolini impersonating a German. And it oh, was, sorry. Like, sorry. Okay. That's okay. I wasn't clear. That's okay. I, it needs work and I'm, you know, I can grow and I appreciate the feedback. Um, <laughs> so there were um, many more other, uh, also these Nazi UFOs. I mean, they found so many before 47 that it's laughable that, uh, you know, this idea that Roswell was kind of the kickoff of this and it's just nonsense. But Something I did want to um, point out here is that recently my wife and I had this on, and this is something that I hadn't heard in the Ghostbusters movie. It's when they're in the jail scene. This is from 1984, and they're talking about the building itself. So I'd just like to play this. It's just a couple minutes long here. Can everybody hear that? No. No? No, unfortunately, no. Uh, hang on one second. You're going to have to, I think, I unshare. And, that's right. Yeah. That's right. My apologies, audience. I'm I'm better than this. But again, this is a no problem. Learn and grow. And how about now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Everybody getting this so far? So what? I guess they just don't make them like they used to, huh? No. Nobody ever made them like this. I mean, the architect was either a certified genius or an authentic wacko. Ray, for a moment... Pretend that I don't know anything about metallurgy, engineering, or physics, and just tell me what the hell is going on. You never studied. The whole building is a huge superconductive antenna that was designed and built expressly for the purpose of pulling in and concentrating spiritual turbulence. Your girlfriend lives in the corner penthouse of Spook Central. She's not my girlfriend. I find her interesting because she's a client and because she sleeps above her covers. Four feet above her covers. She barks, she drools, she claws. It's not the girl, Peter, it's the building. Something terrible is about to enter our world and this building is obviously the door. The architect's name was Evo Shandor. I found it in Tobin's spirit guide. He was also a doctor. Performed a lot of unnecessary surgery. And then in 1920, he started a secret society. Let me guess. Gozer worshippers. Right. No studying. After the First World War, Shandor decided that society was too sick to survive. And he wasn't alone. He had close to no. a thousand followers when he died. They conducted rituals up on the roof. 
bizarre rituals intended to bring about the end of the world, and now it looks like it may actually happen. So be good, for goodness sake. Whoa, somebody's we coming. We have to get out of here. we got to find a judge or something. Whenever you look into this, because they were back there in 1984. I mean, I appreciate, sorry, I appreciate you showing me this. This is far more telling than I thought. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. We just had it on. I was like, what the fuck? And so, yeah. Ackroyd, by the way, his family, um, you know, Canadian also, their uh, Dave shout out. Uh, he uh, has a lifetime. His parents, his grandfather, his dad, everybody was a paranormal investigators, uh, big paranormal stuff. So, he actually wrote Ghostbusters, Dan Ackroyd, the actor, and big into this kind of stuff. And so, whenever mm. he peppers things, keep in mind that his family is all from poltergeist activity spiritual world and then he wrote this movie and then he writes lines like that in this to where he talks about architects you know uh, performing rituals and building buildings that were piezoelectric or spiritual antennas is how he put it but how mm -hmm. i heard it was etheric antennas right because they're talking about them being able to perform rituals to call in the end of the world what if the opposite was true that when they actually erected these buildings and built them with the intent and purpose to benefit everyone and utilize this power for good right Boom. i'm i'm with i'm with, it's the same yep it's the same idea of the the dual use concept it could be used for either or and i think that's fantastic cool Mike, i wrap it with that so thank you this is awesome that's a beautiful that's a beautiful thing so i just i just want to thank both you guys for for uh for being able to come together so we could do this and uh i think this is going to be an absolute hit for for my uh my, my members for certain and uh is there anything else matt that you wanted to touch on or end off with no just to say thank you both this was absolutely fascinating i learned so much and i'm going to be watching this episode myself several times over and studying its content so thank you very much dave thank you for sharing your your insights your expertise brandon yourself as well um your beautiful soul i uh, appreciate all the kind words that you uh send out to me and, and uh, it's heartfelt and and thank you both thank you so much guys we'll talk soon love you guys cheers guys bye-bye